So Marina, uh, Marina O'Connell is the director of the APOT Centre, so we'll be hearing from her first. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me uh, tonight. So um, I've been asked to talk a little bit about the APOT Centre that's based at Huxham's Cross Farm. Um, and we're based in Dartington, so that's South Devon, just outside Totnes. Um, so uh, I am going to see if I can share a screen. Okay, so um, the Apricot Centre is uh, a CIC, a not-for-profit uh, company or a for-purpose company. And the purpose that we, um, we, we aim to fulfil is that we're a farm um, producing uh, fruit, vegetables, um, small scale relocalized grain and um, eggs. Um, we have a training center um, that I'll talk about in a moment, and uh, we also have a well being service. So, well being service is what I call a, a clinical well being service in a non clinical setting. So, my husband's a psychotherapist. And we give therapy to young adopted and looked after children and their families in and around the spaces on the farm with a team of uh, inc incredible um, psychotherapists. We're, we're on a 13 acre, 13 hectare site, sorry, 37 acres. And the farm was bought by the Biodynamic Land Trust in 2015. <clears throat> it was bought from Dartington Hall Trust um, and the Biodynamic Land Trust then uh, rent it to the Apricot Centre. So we're the tenants. And the Biodynamic Land Trust is itself a, um, uh, a, a CBT, community, no, hang on, sorry. I'm not feeling very well today, so I'm really sorry. But uh, Community Benefits Society. So it's like a co-op, but to keep land in sustainable food production in perpetuity. So the Apricot Centre took on the site. So um, this is what it looked like in about 2016. And what we did was we went through a permaculture design process. So we um, so the, the, the site was six fields, basically, three of which had been arable, two were wetland meadows that had been abandoned. And uh, one was a, um, the contractor said was a miserable bit of land and uh, you can't grow anything on it. So the, the arable fields have been in industrial barley for about uh, 40 years. So they were in a bit of a sorry state. So we went through a permaculture design process with the BDLT and the BDLT had sold shares in this farm. So we've got 150 shareholders in the farm and lots of stakeholders or interested parties, local people nearby and people not nearby who were interested in, in how we set about doing this. We put the farm into biodynamic uh, registration, so it's now a fully biodynamic farm. And what you can see there is some of the agroforestry rows as we laid them out. So <clears throat> what we did is use these three methods to create what I call a regenerative farm. And the farm was designed really with four aims, uh, four challenges in mind. So we've got climate change, of course. So as a, a farmer, we, we are able to mitigate or sequester carbon, but also we need to decarbonize ourselves. Um, farms need to be resilient to climate change because now we have climate change in real time. And so in, in, especially in, uh, in, in reference to water, we need to be have farms that are behaving like sponges that soak water up when it's there and hang on to it when it's not there. Um, we've got a biodiversity uh, catastrophe on top of that. So these farms need to um, support biodiversity. And on top of that, we need to produce food, lots of local healthy food, nutrient dense food um, for the local, in, local population. So we, we chose to reflect what we grew um, uh, uh, as to what is regarded as a healthy planetary diet. So that's lots of fruit and vegetables a little bit of grain, um, some eggs and a little bit of meat. Our farm is too small to produce meat, so we don't do that. But we might do, um, I was going to talk about some of our projects in a moment, and it might be that's something we can do as we get a large piece of land. So, um, so because of, um, uh, because of our, um, 
150 investors, uh, we were asked to do an impact assessment on the work uh, on the work that we did. So we did that after five years. And what we found was that we are sequestering 10 tonnes of carbon per hectare per year, of which we use 50%. So we are what's called carbon negative, which is positive. Um, because we have a huge amount of diversity in our cropping, it meant we're resilient. We just about managed to, 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 to uh, scrape through this summer at least. And um, we also collect rainwater and we managed to store a lot of water um, a, in ponds and tanks, but also by doing something called key lime ploughing and using all these agroforestry roads. You can't quite see on that picture, but what we've done, that's a south facing slope and we've planted agroforestry roads across the contour of the farm. And um, <clears throat> so what that means is when it rains, the water, instead of running down the hill, it actually penetrates de deep into the soil. I often refer to it as rehydrating uh, the system. Um, and we use these, something called a key lime plough, which kind of cuts a slice in the soil. So again, on the contour. So when it rains, it percolates deep down into the soil, holding onto the water. Um, we found our bird biodiversity has gone up. So um, our earthworm population has gone up by about 400%. Um, bird species up by <clears throat> 30%. And um, we count the orchids in the wetland meadows and they've gone up by about 500%. We produce a huge amount of food, um, and we, all of which is sold within a 20 mile radius. And we are also economically viable, which many farms aren't at the moment. So um, we don't import, we, we've designed a closed loop system. So we don't import any, not of, of course, because we're biodynamic, we don't import any fertility. Um, and I, I, I was interviewed by The Guardian this summer to say, well, what do you use if you don't use nitrate fertilisers? This was in the context because of the Ukrainian war. Nitrate fertilisers have gone up um, by about 300 percent in price. So I sat in a field of clover and said, this is what we use instead, um, which seemed like a radical thought, really, that you can use plants instead of nitrate fertilizers for fertility, but of course they also are uh, support biodiversity. So, and they also were deep rooting, so they hang onto the water in the soil. So very multifunctional. So just to show you a few more things that we've been doing, this is an agroforestry field. And uh, so the fruit trees in there are apple trees and um, <clears throat> um, uh, they're 20 meters apart. And in between we're growing, um, uh, uh, wheats. Well, those are actually oats, but the wheats that we're growing are have been bred for genetic diversity, not using GMO, of course, but using old fashioned methods um, like a paintbrush uh, to cross fertilize them. And they're extremely resilient to climate change. And what we've done is we've gone into business with our neighbors, uh, with a bakery and a larger farm um, next door. And we have uh, created a company called Reclaim the Grain and we've bought a small mill from America and um, what we do is we um, the wheat that we're harvesting we mill it and make it into bread so we're trying to decommodify and shorten the supply chains and this is also a really important part of decarbonizing farms because um, a huge amount of um, carbon used in food in the food system is for transport and refrigeration so food supply chains, as I said, um, th uh, uh, food, food, when it's moved around the world, is, uh, uses up a huge amount of um, fuel uh, and refrigeration, and a huge amount of it gets wasted, something like 30%. So by shortening the supply chain, um, you can uh, decarbonize your food system very effectively. Um, what I just also didn't point out is that when you stop using nitrate fertilizers you also decarbonize your food system um we uh so we, sorry just going back to that last point we've joined up um also so we we, we, we sell our vegetables through something called community supported agriculture and we also do the local market 
but we joined up with a, a, a group of um, about 20 or 30 other local food hubs and we've called it the good food loop so we're, we're really relocalizing food within the county of Devon between us and they're all agroecology farms another small project we've done is taken on um, uh, 25 acres next door to our farm so these are glebe fields so they're taking them on from we're renting them from um, the Diocese of Exeter. Um, the Diocese of Exeter, uh, um, or the Church of England, is, is, has a stated aim of being carbon net zero by 2030 or 35, but they're focusing mostly on their buildings. So um, we've suggested to them that if we take on this 25 acres, which we, we have now, um, that we will give them half of the carbon that we sequester as a means of paying down their carbon burden. So we're a little bit of a pilot for them, but they've got 2000 acres in Devon alone, um, over 250 glebe fields. And so what they want us to do is to run a bit of a pilot and do some of our analysis and use that as a, a, a way to encourage their other farmers to uh, become regenerative. <clears throat> um, the last, couple of years we've been asked um, by a Devon Environmental Foundation um, that if, if their aim or, or in fact the government's stated aim is that 30% um, of Devon or the whole of the UK will be for nature by 2030 they asked us how could that be done we suggested there's no training in regenerative farming systems so Devon County Council and some ge generous uh, benefactors such as Vibo Barefoot have helped us set a, up a formal qualification with Crossfields Institute. It's a level three in uh, regenerative land-based systems. It, it runs over a year. We've got 20 lovely young people this year, so you can see them there learning about permaculture design. They're based on farms four days a week and they come in for training one day a week and that is paid for by the government, by Devon County Council. Um, quite hard work, but uh, very enjoyable. So I just wanted to um, finish on, on this. Um, uh, Jules Pritty, who's one of the UK's or the world's leading um, writers and researchers on regenerative or agroecology food systems, um, just produced this. So I appreciate this isn't, you can't really see this, but 30% uh, in individual people's foot, carbon footprint, of that 30%, is, is in your food system. So reducing your carbon, your individual carbon footprint can be done by um, buying organic food, local food, eating seasonal food, um, or food that is agroecology might not be registered organic. So although I appreciate that that's expensive, um, but it's a really, really effective way to reduce your carbon footprint very rapidly. And of course, the food then that you buy is more tasty and it's more healthy and um, often is more fun if you can join in with um, either a local farm or <clears throat> get an allotment and grow some of your own food. Um, and, and finally, uh, just to say that I wrote a, a, a book um, that was published this year on, on kind of explaining what some of these systems are, um, biodynamics, permaculture, agroforestry, um, some of the science behind soil ecology that we're just beginning to understand and how soil is so effective at um, soaking up carbon emissions. So that was um, a quick whiz through what we're doing at the Apricot Centre. Thank you so much, Marina. Thank you for sharing your work with us. Um, and thank you so much for coming on when you're not feeling great. Um, yeah. yeah. Next, we have Duncan Baker Brown. He uh, wasn't able to meet uh, join us tonight, so he's prepared a um, clip for us to play. Um, he'll be speaking about uh, woodland working and sweet chestnut coppicing. Hello, uh, my name is Duncan Baker Brown. I'm an architect, um, a researcher, academic, and environmental activist. And I'm going to talk to you about timber in the construction sector and the unexpected benefits of specifying timber. Uh, I'm just going to share my slides. Right, I'll start with a couple of statistics to give you a sort of sense of where I'm coming from. We've got to reduce 
the amount of stuff we consume. So we've got to reuse before we recycle, but we've got to reuse a lot and adapt a lot already. And one of the reasons is that the built environment industry consumes 50% of all raw materials harvested and mined every year. The UK on its own generates about 200 million tonnes of waste a year, with 60% of that coming from the construction sector. That's 120 million tonnes of stuff being thrown away in the UK just from the construction sector every year. The last statistic is the fact on this page is the fact that 45% of all CO2 emissions for, that the UK generates one way or another comes from the construction sector. So humankind needs to learn how to manage planet Earth's resources responsibly. We've got to reduce the consumption of stuff big time. And it's all about managing these resources. And it's often designers and constructors who do this, my industry. So there are opportunities, as with all these scary things. And one of them, I think, is to rework the stuff that for the last 200 years humans have been manufacturing and producing. In other words, to mine the Anthropocene, the Anthropocene being the current geological uh, era that we're in, but it's also the stuff that wraps planet Earth, the human made stuff. Now, if we close down most mines, we could nurture the natural world and mine the Anthropocene and rework this existing stuff, this pre-produced stuff. And that's something that we're trying to apply with our work as architects, and we're not the only ones, there's many architects and designers doing this now. How do we adapt something rather than demolish and start again? Now, what you're looking at here is a map of where I'm from, just north of Brighton, a place called Lewis. And the darker green stuff is the South Downs along the bottom and the high wheel to the north. And this is the sort of countryside within which the city of Brighton is set. And it's also potentially a resource. And it's a landscape that's been worked by humans for the last 2000 years at least. Now, what this map is actually showing is a site in the middle there and then a radius of 5, 10 and 15 miles. And what we're doing there is applying this raw resource mapping exercise where we look at what the site has to provide in terms of resources, materials, a, a human networks, also ambient energies like from the sun and from the earth. But what we're really trying to together is to put trying to do is to put together materials and stuff to create the new building. Now, one of the things that we have in Sussex is a lot of standing sweet chestnut. This was originally planted by the Romans and they brought it over because it's such a durable uh, timber. They could use the timber in the, in the ground and it wouldn't rot. And that's what we did it for the, with it for the next 2000 years. It's great for fence posts. It's also great for making charcoal, so it sustained the Iron Age. But what you're looking at here is a managed woodland in Sussex. And on the left, you've got the image of just when the timber's been culled, but crucially, they leave a crown just above the ground so the roots don't die. So this woodland, the timber might own, that's growing above ground might only be 25 years old, but what's below ground is a very healthy and established, maybe 200 year old root system. The image on the right is two years later. So because of the established roots, this sweet chestnut coppice has, the new shoots grow really quickly. But what you get is per crown, you get maybe eight or 10 of these stems growing. And if they're harvested after 25 years, they're very useful and they're quite straight and they're basically poles. But what's amazing is you've got a really super deep carbon sink because the roots established. It's often said if you plant trees, uh, you've got to wait 30 years before you get any type of benefit from the tree in terms of uh, carbon sink not with a sweet chestnut coppice. The other thing is, because you're um, changing the environment of the coppice by carefully managing it, by chopping bits of it down uh, after 20, 25 years, if you manage these woodlands, you actually create a greater level of biodiversity than if you leave them alone, which is incredible because this stuff now we can use in the construction sector. So there's the pile of the timber on the left. Here's um, a colleague of mine, Nigel Braden, who's sorting and grading this timber. 
Now, Nigel wrote a paper with the Building Research Establishment a number of years ago that proved that quick grain sweet chestnut that was only 25 years old was more durable than 300 year old oak. In other words, leave the oak trees alone so they can support up to a thousand species just by existing, which is incredible, and rework those Roman and Iron Age uh, working woodlands that, and work with that sweet chestnut. Now, what's amazing is that that pile of what looks like twigs can actually make beautiful things for, tim for, for the construction sector, such as these timber planks that we can use as external cladding. And these planks can be up to 17 meters long because they, what Nigel does, and if you see the image on the right, you can just see the finger jointing, the sort of zigzag line, the jointing. The timber is so stable that you can get it into lengths of up to 16 meters and it doesn't move. The other thing is it's self-finished. You don't have to treat it and it lasts for a long time. I put this material on my own house 20 years ago and it still looks brilliant. It's gonna last 60 years easily. But it's not just for cladding, you can also use it um, uh, for structural columns and beams. And what you're looking at here is a glue laminated uh, sweet chestnut column on the left and a, a curved roof beam on the right. And here they are being installed on a building in Hastings. And this is an internal shot of the structure and the roof finish, all in sweet chestnut. This sweet chestnut was with, um, was, um, from within, I think, 12 miles of the construction site itself. And that's the final building. It's a visitor center in Hastings. The cladding is timber where it, um, as, uh, as well. Now, you can just use it anywhere. I mean, here's a, a, a building in, in uh, the University of Brighton that we did, and the columns that you can just about see, the sort of gingery br uh, brown columns, they're three stories high, and they're made of sweet chestnut um, glue laminated together. Here's uh, chestnut uh, shakes for uh, the external finish of a school. Again, within about 10 miles of uh, uh, the site that's where this timber comes from. And what was nice here was a primary school and the primary school kids went out to see uh, where the timber had come for to make their classroom. Now, when we do these resource maps, we find other stuff. So there's a couple of projects that we've got on site at the moment where one of the materials we've found has a bit of a sorry tale, but everybody knows about it now, I think, or a lot of people do. And that's this disease that's killing our ash trees. It's called ash dieback. And we've got a lot of it in the south east of England. What's really sad is these trees are being chopped down, but they're then just being sent to, to for incineration to just as be as biomass. So they're being chipped and then sent to a, a factory in Kent to be burned. But this timber is although it's dying and it doesn't look very promising there and you know there's nasty headlines about it the good news is that in some cases you can reuse it and so this is timber that we actually actively went and chased down as it were and found um being chopped down uh, on an estate near uh, where our office is and this was destined for being chipped but instead we saw we got it sawn up into planks and you can see how beautiful the timber is that was that was going to be chipped and burnt ash is really beautiful timber and we've turned it into the structure for a couple of buildings and these photographs are a bit boring perhaps but they're not to me because they're the structure of um, a house and a new building for Glyndebourne arriving on site and uh, it's made out of ash dieback and some I, I don't know if anybody else that's doing this so if anybody does please tell me if anybody knows of anyone using it please tell me and you can see how beautiful the timber is there on the right. Now, just to summarize, don't throw ash away for a start. Our landscapes can perhaps be managed in a productive way that gives us some material to work with in the construction sector, but also at the same time supports a biodiverse environment. We learned, we need to learn how to live in harmony with the planet, work with it. And I think we actually know what to do. So I ask you, what's stopping you? Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Ed, for sharing that. So Duncan prepared that clip for us because he wasn't able to attend tonight. Um, yeah, so great to hear about all the different ways um, we can live more sustainably. Um, so next we have Rebecca Knowles, who is uh, the director of Stock Free Farming. Hi, everybody. Thank you. I will just 
uh, share my screen. Um, so Stock Free Farming, we are a Scottish based uh, not for profit organisation. So I'm actually speaking from Scotland today. I live on the west side of the Cairngorms. Uh, and what we do is we help farmers and crofters shift out of environmentally burdensome livestock agriculture into fairer, greener livelihoods. So why does this matter? Why, why does it matter to help farmers shift out of livestock agriculture? And how does that fit with the climate change uh, agenda and also with Just Stop Oil's agenda? Well, if we take a look, I hope you can see this everybody, uh, at the various sectors that contribute to climate change. Um, this is a graph showing emissions from the baseline year of 1990 all the way to 2020. So it's over a 30 year period. And you can probably see that blue line on the top that comes down uh, quite rapidly and jaggedly. Um, that is energy supply. So over the past 30 years, energy supply emissions have come down in Scotland. We don't burn coal anymore to create electricity. Um, below that line, we have uh, the green line is domestic transport. Then we have um, the business sector. And below that, you see a blue line that is almost flat going across the middle of the screen. And this is agriculture. So agriculture has been dragging its feet in terms of emissions uh, since the baseline year of 1990. And it's actually the third highest contributor to emissions in Scotland after transport and business. Even energy supply is lower than agriculture um, now. So if we break that down into the various greenhouse gases, this pie chart shows those. And there we have methane, um, methane mostly uh, coming from animal agriculture, mostly coming from uh, the enteric fermentation of ruminants and also from animal manure, a very potent greenhouse gas, 23 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. And we also have nitrous oxide. Once again, that's from nitrogenous fertilizers and uh, animal waste, uh, potent greenhouse gas, 296 times the global warming potential of CO2. And on this pie chart, um, methane is taking up 22.4% and it's been increasing. If we look at the pie chart from 2017, methane was only 15.8%. Nitrous oxide is currently 9.1%, and in 2017, just three years ago, it was 7.9%. And it's not just that carbon dioxide is decreasing, it's that these gases are actually on the increase. So farming's contribution to climate change, it's not just about greenhouse gases, is it? It's also about land use, and we've heard quite a lot about that this evening. And George Monbiot says that perhaps the most important, important of all environmental issues is land use. So if we take a look at that, um, this map is from the National Food Strategy. Some of you might be familiar with it. And it shows, it's not a geographically accurate map, it's a proportionate map showing how we use our land in the United Kingdom. And we can see quite clearly that farming is the most land hungry of all human activities. Um, and what this map tells us is that 85% of the farmland that feeds the UK is used to rear animals. That's either for grazing or producing their food. And more than half of that 85% is overseas. So we're farming out our land footprint for feed and we're farming out our carbon footprint. And in return for that 85%, we're only receiving 32% of our calories and less than half of our protein. So clearly it's a very inefficient use of land. Um, one thing a lot of people don't know is that we have enough existing arable land in the UK to provide for the calorific nutrient and protein needs of us all. We don't need to be importing 50% of our food. We can grow it all ourselves if we shift to plant-based diets. The issue is that 55% of our arable land in the UK is currently being used to grow livestock feed. So shifting to plant-based production and consumption would save us a heck of a lot of land and also reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, this field actually, this field is quite close to my house on the edge of the Cairngorms. Uh, it's a field of peas in case you can't see it clearly, an absolute pristine field of peas. And I was chatting to the farmer there and I said, wow, I can't believe the whole village isn't in here with their colanders. this is amazing. 
And he said, oh, come back and see the harvest. And I did. And I said, you know, what are you going to do with all the peas? And the peas were going to feed his beef herd through the winter. And none of this was going for human consumption. And as it says on this slide, plant proteins use 150 times less land and emit 70 times less greenhouse gases than the equivalent of amount, amount of beef. And that is from the National Food Strategy. In fact, it said that the biggest carbon benefit of eating less meat is the opportunity to then repurpose the land that we save to sequester carbon. And that's what this next slide is about. This is called the carbon opportunity cost. The carbon opportunity cost of not using the land that livestock occupies for carbon sequestration by returning it to nature, also known as rewilding. And I know we've got a rewilding talk coming up next. And as you can see from this chart, lamb, uh, lamb and mutton top the bill there, followed by beef. When you factor in repurposing the land, carbon opportunity cost of the land. So we're not talking here about repurposing productive arable land. No, we need that arable land to grow our plant-based food. But much of the land we're talking about here is, is our uplands. And you know, our uplands that we think are sort of the iconic grassy moors and fields, much of our uplands were once temperate rainforest and peat bog. So we're talking about the least productive land. The least productive 20% of our land only gives us 3% of our calories. And so obviously it's not very efficient for food production. In terms of lamb and mutton, they only give us 1%, just over 1% of our calories in the UK. In Scotland, where I live, there's a great potential for this because in Scotland, 86% of our agricultural land in Scotland is classed as less favoured areas. In other words, it's very challenging for growing food and in some cases, it's completely impracticable because of topography. So 86% less favoured areas in Scotland, only 18% is less favoured areas in England. So we looked at the potential. What is the potential if we took all of Scotland's grazing land, permanent grazing land, 80% of Scotland's agricultural land is permanent grassland. What would it mean if we were to repurpose that um, for climate change mitigation? And that's what this slide is about. Uh, if we were to return all permanent grazing land in Scotland, to its climax vegetation, and that means it's indigenous vegetation, what the land would naturally, naturally return to over time if we just left it alone, it would remove the equivalent of 40 years of current Scottish CO2 emissions. And that's amazing, that's amazing. But then, you know, you say to yourself, but what farmer is gonna be willing to do that? What farmer who has sheep or cattle is gonna be willing to change and become the custodian of a rewilding project? You know, when you listen to the NFU, when you listen to the farming press, they really portray, don't they, this adherence to tradition, uh, this resistance to change. You know, we might be going to hell in a handbasket, but we're taking our cows and sheep with us. So we questioned that and we said, you know, do farmers really have this inseparable attachment to livestock or might they be open to change? So we decided to do a survey um, to research some of those points. And this was one of the questions on the survey. On the areas of your farm or craft that are rough grazing or permanent pasture and providing financial support is in place, would you be willing to transition out of livestock agriculture entirely into farming carbon capture by helping the land return to its natural state? This was the last question um, on our survey and we, we went farm to farm with this survey. It took us a year. And uh, we asked this question and we held our breath. Surely nobody would say yes. But 64% of farmers and crofters in Scotland said yes or maybe to this question. And most of those were yeses. It was 36% yes, 28% maybe, 36% no. So this showed us that farm, contrary to popular belief, farmers are open and willing to change. And we've been shocked how much so. You know, the Scottish Programme for Government this year stated that they wanted to design support schemes to encourage a reduction in grazing pressure in the uplands. And this is the farmers saying, yeah, if the support is there, then we are willing to do it. 
Uh, so we've recently produced a report based on this survey. This just came out last week. It's already gone to the Scottish government. It's a lobbying tool because we're also a lobbying organization. Uh, you might like to look at the report. It's at stockfreefarming.org slash survey hyphen report. Um, it lists specific recommendations to the Scottish government at the end of the report to basically stop supporting uh, schemes that deliberately promote upland sheep, that deliberately promote the Scottish Suckler Beef Support Scheme, and to reassign that money towards uh, supporting our goals. Another question in the survey, this is just another chart from the survey report, is we asked farmers about their motivation. And this question, are you motivated to change your current farming practice to help? mitigate climate change, ensure the financial security of your enterprise, meet changing consumer preferences, improve the country's food security and food self-sufficiency. And I should say that, that the survey had a video in the middle, an informational video in the middle. And one of the things in the video was about this shift in consumer preferences towards plant-based diets. So this question was based on this. In terms of the shift towards plant-based diets, would you be willing to change your farming practice in order to meet changing consumer preferences? And you can see there that 80% of farmers and crofters answered yes or maybe to this question, that they would be willing to change their farming practice to meet changing consumer preferences. So that, that's very encouraging. You know, it means that we there's something that we can do right here and now. We don't have to wait for the government to do something but we can all take personal responsibility for the climate crisis in the most effective way we can. And that's with our forks, basically. Um, and there's a study that I'm sure many of you will be familiar with that concurs with this. Uh, this is from Joseph Poor, Oxford University. Uh, the citation is on the bottom of the slide. I really encourage you to read this if you're not familiar with it. And Joseph Poor was interviewed and said, a vegan diet is probably the single biggest way to reduce your impact on planet Earth. Not just greenhouse gases, but global acidification, eutrophication, land use and water use. It is far bigger than cutting down on your flights or buying an electric car as these only cut greenhouse gas emissions. And the conclusion of the survey there on the bottom of the slide, moving from current diets to diets that exclude animal products reduces food land use by 76% and foods greenhouse gas emissions by up to 73%. That's massive, isn't it? So if we want to do the maximum we can to avert climate change and save our planet, this is a critical step uh, that each of us needs to take. And I think that's almost it from me. I just like to leave you with our, our website, uh, stockfreefarming.org. We do have a join button if you're interested in following what we do, uh, we have a webinar series coming up in November, and this is a follow-up from the farmers survey. 63% of the farmers and crofters that we surveyed were asking for more information about shifting to growing crops for human consumption, about restoring native trees and ecosystems, about diversifying into non-traditional agricultural initiatives. And this webinar series will address that. We've got some experts talking about cutting edge uh, developments in farming. So if you want to join us, you'll get an email uh, about our webinar series. Uh, if you want to email me, I'm Rebecca at stockfreefarming.org. And uh, I think that's about it for me. Thanks so much for listening, everybody. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, really fantastic talk. And um, yeah, great to hear about Stock Free Farming. And that runs in perfectly to Annie Randall, who will be talking about the wildcard uh, rewilding campaign. Thank you so much for having me. Can you can you hear me okay? Is that all good? Okay, awesome. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm from Wildcard. It's a grassroots rewilding campaign based in the UK. Um, and we have a kind of big overall aim to get 50% of the UK rewilded, uh, starting with the UK's biggest landowners. So ultimately we're honing in on the issue of land inequality, while also trying to promote rewilding as a climate solution. So I'm gonna talk about some slightly depressing aspects of what's happening to the world. Uh, and then we'll kind of move up and talk about rewilding and the potential that it has. Um, so I think we all probably know that 
many animals and plants are in decline and we're losing about 200 species a day, which is quite significant. Um, and many of us aren't really familiar anymore with the kind of buzzing, snuffling and twittering that previous generations knew so well. Um, and I think one of the important things to remember we, when we contemplate that is that biodiversity loss isn't separate from climate change. In fact, they reinforce each other quite significantly um, for worse, not for better. So if we zoom out at the bigger picture, um, in 2021, UN published uh, a report stating that alongside other efforts, we need to rewild an area the size of China if we are to properly tackle the climate and ecological emergency. And uh, degradation of uh, ecosystems already threatening 40% of the world's population. So it's also about supporting um, the, the communities most vulnerable to climate change. So if we zoom back into the UK, the UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. Um, in fact, alongside that, we've got quite a bizarre nostalgia for a nature that isn't particularly natural. And I, I had a great photo here of um, just kind of a big expanse of fields with sheep in, uh, sheep, cows, like things that we really you know. They're even on the, the Yorkshire tea box. We, we, we have such a, an emotional attachment to these images. Um, and I think that a big part of that is with the EU common agricultural policy, farmers were encouraged to work every square inch of their land, regardless of trees, marshes or meadows. And this has been an ecological disaster. You know, in the UK, we now have thousands of miles of barren landscape where no insects are even to be seen. And even worse, this exacerbates the cycle of flash floods and seasonal droughts as the water isn't held in the soil, as people were talking about previously in the call. Um, and in the UK, it's often the poorer communities in the north of England that have really had to bear the brunt of this, with floods destroying their communities every single year. So there's an additional cost to climate mitigation that could be avoided through better land practices rather than agricultural intensification. Um, and unfortunately, we thought we might be heading the right direction uh, with the ELMS project in terms of government subsidies, but it seems that now doing a U-turn on this uh, with the new cabinet, unfortunately. So at Wildcard, uh, which is the small grassroots campaign that I'm part of, uh, alongside our friends at Lost Rainforest, one of the things we're working on alongside Rewild in the UK is also talking about bringing back the lost temperate rainforest, which is something that Rebecca mentioned. Um, and so temperate rainforests might not be something that's actually familiar with many people, but actually the UK has the prime conditions for a lot of temperate rainforest alongside the, the left side of the UK. So it's defined by epiphytes, which are basically plants that enjoy growing off other plants, like moss, lichen, ferns. It's a really green, uh, green moist environment. And uh, I also had a wonderful hydrothermy map to show you, but I can't show that either. <laughs> so that's basically a map showing the interplay of heat and moisture. So we can look at this and altitude and temperature, and we can project where the temperate rainforest would exist. So I kind of want everyone to imagine small fragments of green going down the left side of the UK, um, and that's where the temperate rainforest would be. Um, some, a very small part of temperate rainforest does still exist, 0.1%, um, tiny fragments. So we can look at it and we can enjoy it, but actually it's also a terrible reminder of how much we've lost. And one example of this is Wisman Woods uh, in Devon, uh, which you go and visit and it's beautiful, but it is surrounded by hundreds of acres of barren landscape that has been overgrazed by sheep farming. And actually, Wism Wismans Wood exists in this tiny fenced off area when it should be dominating the landscape. Um, and so this, this type of barren landscape surrounding Wismans Wood isn't unique to England at all. In fact, there are parts of Wales uh, that are considered terrestrial dead zones. Um, for example, in the Cambrian Mountains, there's an area that spans around 300 square kilometres. And you probably find more wildlife there than in your back garden than on a 10 kilometer hike across those mountains. Um, they're essentially a desert. And the thing is, these are complex systems. They're full of tipping points just as nature is. So it's very easy to lose these vital ecosystems and not so easy to get them back. 
So as I've said, UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. We rank 189th out of 280 na nations for the intactness of living systems. So having trashed our own wildlife, we have our excessive demand for meat, animal feed, timber, minerals, fossil fuels. We continue to trash the rest of the world, but we love nature, we love wildlife. So how is it that we're letting ecosystems that took millions of years to evolve be destroyed in a matter of years? Psychologically speaking, one thing here is shifting baseline syndrome. So people might be familiar with this already. It was first discussed in the 60s with regards to natural architecture and later by fisher in, in terms of fisheries um, by a fisheries scientist called Daniel Pauley. And he noticed that people were comparing fish population figures with those at the beginning of their career rather than decades before. So they were seeing considerably less change. So with shifting baseline syndrome, we suffer a loss of perception of change as each generation redefines what is considered natural or normal. And with that, we fail to see the scale of the crisis around us. Um, and, you know, we may look around and think that we are rich in biodiversity, but actually we're not. And the numbers don't lie. So since 1970, we've lost 60% of all animal species. Uh, and instead, we've replaced wild animals with agricultural animals. When I say we, we're talking about industrialized societies, the ones pushing the exploitative, extractive agenda. Um, I also had a lovely little pie chart to show here, uh, but I'll have to describe it instead. So uh, <laughs> a staggering 60% of all biomass on the planet is now farm animals. So we can see the connections here, agriculture, land use, pollution, loss of biodiversity, in turn changing the natural environment and exacerbating climatic changes. So as humans, we do tend to know right from wrong. We know that this doesn't seem right, um, but what's hindered this change? And part of that is shifting baseline sy uh, syndrome. We've normalized extensive sheep farming in the UK, but our native trees have no natural defenses against these animals. So we end up with miles and miles of overgrazed land deplete of any other life apart from cattle. So with shifting baseline syndrome, our expectations diminish from one, one generation to the next. So what does rewilding have to play in this? Um, so we've covered some of the rather depressing bits, terrifying loss of biodiversity, deforestation, or problem with misremembering the past. Um, but there is hope. There really is, and that's why we're all here to talk this evening. Um, we have some of the world's, we have the world's best engineers, problem solvers, and experts on our doorstep, and that is just simply nature itself. We just got to let it happen. So I'll go through some of the key principles of rewilding, and then I'll talk about what our campaign is actually doing. So this is very basic. Um, I really recommend people to delve deeper into this afterwards. Um, so the first one is just let it go. Now, governments don't really like this. It's hard to measure. The nature-based economies don't always fit into their capitalist agenda, but it's incredible what can happen when nature is left to restore with seeds being shared far and wide through natural dispersion. Um, keystone species. So imagine a medieval bridge supported by several keystones. If you remove these, the bridge collapses. So keystone species, animal, plants, fungi, they're essential to maintaining a healthy ecosystem. Some of these in the UK are wolves, beavers, pigs, longhorned cattle, um, which previously would have been oryx, wild boar, for example. Um, so to better explain one example, beavers, which I'm sure everybody knows what a beaver looks like. Uh, they construct dams, which end up being surrounded by wetlands, normally around 10 meters wide. It's actually thought the water voles co-evolved with beavers. Um, and of course, they then create an ecosystem where they've created this uh, collection of water. Um, and they're good for humans. In the UK, the dewilded uplands in the north, often further devastated by floods. But with beavers creating natural dams, they could be one of the best engineers against these floods, creating mini dams that slow the flow of the water, also enabling carbon sequestration. So um, another uh, key theme of rewilding is mosaic habitat. So if we're looking to create an ideal, then it would be a mosaic habitat, so which we've lost due to monoculture and industrial agriculture. 
So this is woodlands, wildflower meadows, grasslands, peatlands. There's no real orderly way to do this. In fact, mess is good. And remember, we're talking about complex systems here as well. So what does this mean for the planet? Well, this requires us returning to nature-based land practices, wilder farming, moving away from monoculture, and essentially towards plant-based food systems. Um, we can't grow food without healthy soil. And rewilding has incredible potential. Uh, with more land handed back over to nature, we could not only cool the planet, but actively draw carbon down from the atmosphere, stabilizing the climate. The climate. It's essentially the perfect form of natural geoengineering. Um, and there are some figures here that Rebecca has already shown on the screen, um, which show that 85% of the entire farmed area in the UK um, is for animal products or animal feed. So the facts are staring right in front of us. They're right in our face. Meat and dairy require considerable amounts more land than plant-based products. And a shift in diet could open up the land for nature and then sequester hundreds of gigatons of carbon dioxide. So what are we trying to do in Wildcard? So we're a grassroots campaign trying to get 50% of the UK rewilded, starting with the UK's biggest landowners. Now we're starting with landowners because unfortunately the UK has a massive problem with land inequality. 50% of the land is owned by just 1% of the population. So if we are to start a rewilding revolution, we need to start with the people that have the land. And as we persist with our 50% demand, we stretch open wide the Overton window, making more conservative rewilding groups targets seem more politically achievable. So just over a year ago, or more than that actually, um, we decided to build uh, campaigns on three of the biggest landowners. That's the Royal Family, the Church of England, and the Ministry of Defence. So our main focus right now is on the Royal Land Holdings which in themselves are an archaic semi-feudal semi -feudal system of uh, semi-public private enterprises. It's, it's quite complicated and I'm sure that's intentional. Um, so with a small team of volunteers and a wider group of experts, scientists and ecologists to help us, uh, we wanted to create a campaign that appeals to both sides of the political spectrum, gets families and children involved, learning about their natural landscape and about their heritage as well. And our first big move was to write an open letter to the royal family signed by over 100 climate scientists and public figures. Um, alongside this, we managed to get 100,000 people to sign a petition asking the royals to rewild. And then joined by Chris Packham, who was very dedicated to our campaign and a dedicated environmentalist himself, um, we organised a beautiful rally with a giant stork puppet, lots of colourful flags and a children's climate youth choir. And a young boy delivered the letter and petition to the royal household at Buckingham Palace, which has never really been done before. And amazingly, we are actually seeing some results. So we're currently in conversation with one of the core royal land holdings, the Crown Estate. Um, and a bit to our surprise, things seem to be moving. Uh, we've got in contact with other groups which might be able to advise them on how they could actually transition their land. However, the la other landholders, for example, the Duchy of Lancaster and Duchy of Cornwall, um, categorically ruled out meeting with us. But now that the titles have changed in the royal household, we're going to be going straight back to them, um, to reminding, reminding of them of their uh, responsibilities as stewards of the land. So that might give us another opportunity to get our foot in the door. And what's been incredible has been the press coverage. So with just one action outside Buckingham Palace, we made national headlines, were featured in every main newspaper, even internationally in France, Canada and Pakistan. Um, 38 Degrees, helpfully, um, help, they helped us really kindly with some snazzy polls before and after. And we found that actually we changed public opinion by 11% during that time in terms of 11% more of the population supporting the royals rewilding. So I think I went through that all very quickly in the short space of time. Um, but I guess in a nutshell, we're trying to raise awareness of rewilding as one of the best tools for climate mitigation. Uh, we want to educate people about the burning topic of land inequality. Uh, we want to open that Overton window to help other conservative groups' demands seem more achievable and ultimately build a support base that helps empower communities in the world of nature restoration. And I guess at the heart of everything we do, is a really joyful, cheeky, life-affirming form of activism um, that everybody can get involved in. 
So please do go and check out uh, our website. I actually put it in the chat because the presentation didn't work. Um, follow us on social media, join our newsletter. Um, if you want to volunteer, drop us a message. Um, we're more than happy to chat. And uh, thank you so, so much. Wonderful, Annie. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. That was um, yeah, a great way to finish that part of the evening. So, um, so this talk tonight is part of the Just Off Oil Food and Farming series in which we connect um, uh, land and what we eat and how we live in this country with uh, climate breakdown. And next we'll be hearing from Roger Hallam who will be giving us a update on Just Stop Oil. Uh, Just Stop Oil are occupying Westminster this month and uh, we will hear more now. Yeah, thank you so much everyone for coming along and thanks so much to the people who have spoken. And hello Annie, I used to work with Annie a lot. <laughs> I haven't seen you for a bit. Um, yeah, I'm going to be talking uh, sort of se sort of segue, wait, waiting, is that the right word? from uh, the, the sort of whole issues of land use through to the political question of how we get the governments to actually support all of this stuff or at least not make it a lot worse. Um, yeah, I was asked to sort of, I don't usually speak on these calls because I've got lots of other things and there's lots of other important people who can speak about things. But as, as you may know, I was an organic farmer for 30, 30 years. Um, so I started growing when I was like 21 and done something like 35 seasons of growing vegetables. Uh, so I was part of a cooperative farm in Wales. Uh, I was involved in growing veg on um, 15 acres, around 15 acres of land. And it was all very successful. We used to employ about 30 people, we had 20,000 people on our database, about 2,000 boxes a week the biggest box scheme in Wales. Um, and then I think in about 2006, it started raining on the 2nd of June. It rained every single day for seven weeks. All my vegetables rotted in the ground. I had about three quarters of a million seedlings ready to go in, which never got put in. I lost approximately 100,000 pounds. 30 people lost their jobs. Um, it was a major disaster, let's put it like that. But you know, if there's farmers here, you probably, you probably know if you're a farmer, you're a bit, you have to be fairly tough. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if it was one season, then so be it, you know, you just start climbing out of the whole of debt and carry on. But of course, the nature of the climate crisis is such that not only is it not just a one off, it's ongoing. And not only is it ongoing, but it gets exponentially worse. So three years later, it was minus 15. In Wales for the first time in, I can't quite remember when, I think it was around a thousand years. I think it was minus 15 for about a fortnight. So I grew, I grew leeks every year for about 30 years, usually about 30,000 leeks. So that, that winter, I lost all the winter crops, including 30,000 leeks, because they, rot, they froze down to the core. And uh, as everyone knows on this call, uh, if you are involved in growing food, at least commercially, um, Every two to three years, there's an extreme weather event. And we've just had that this summer without, without it raining. I think three years ago, it didn't rain for 12 weeks in Wales in the summer, which is unheard of. And there was trees dying in July. Um, so I'm saying all this because I have a deep love for the land. And really, that's in my soul. And I'm basically heartbroken that this is what's going on. And there's no... There's no sort of light at the end of the tunnel in so much as the powers that be, as we've just seen with Liz Trust, are not, are not actually helping do anything about it. They're making it worse because that's how capitalism works. When it has a, you know, a scarce resource, it just uses it up more, more quickly. So we've got 130 oil fields being opened up. Uh, everyone's up in arms about the new enterprise zones and you know, degrading the prioritization of nature and what have you. So I think one of the sort of unhelpful issues here is people juxtapose like doing political work or, you know, civil resistance uh, with doing 
what Gandhi called constructive program work, which is, you know, doing the amazing things people are doing on this call. Um, that's, it, to my mind, a highly unecological way of looking at system. And the idea of juxtaposing nature with humanity is highly unecological, like humanity is part of nature and nature is part of humanity, and it's all one system. And often I speak to people who are doing you know, regenerative work and they say, oh, I don't want to do you know, civil resistance because that's what I do and, and vice versa, you know, I do something else. Well, you know, the, what I'd like to suggest on this call is first of all, there's 365 days in the year, last time I checked, and doing civil resistance probably effectively requires about seven days a year. Um, in an ecological system, it's a bit like, I like to think it's a bit like, you know, 19th century agriculture where as you may know, everyone went to the field in August to collect the hay in, because if you didn't, then all the other work during the year, year was a, a waste of time. So what I think we need to do is, you know, this October and next April and the following October, which are the best times to do civil resistance, is everybody who's involved in, in the ecological work that we're doing goes to London because that's the most effective way of doing something about the most obscene element of the ecological system we're in, i.e. the governmental system. And i just like to maybe, f I, think, I think someone else is going to explain more of the details. So I'll, I'll just end on a sort of a little analogy here that we had like, you know, massive polytunnels and we grew a lot of food in the polytunnels. And if you're growing food in the polytunnels, you get quite involved in doing the weeding, you know, and the, water, the watering and the cropping. But if the, every now and again, <laughs> at least on our farm, the bloody pump would break, you know, and you think, oh, God, you know, you've got to phone someone up to sort out the pump. So you'd have to get out the polytunnels and get on with it, because at least if it was the summer, if you didn't get the pump sorted out within 48 hours, um, then um, everything in the polytunnel would die. So that was a bit of a drag, right? That's what I see, see us doing civil resistance is no one wants to do it, but unless we do civil resistance, the pump's going to not work and the whole of the ecological system is going to collapse. And that's no exaggeration. I mean, as you may know, because I'm a co-founder of Extinction Rebellion, I talked to a lot of the world's leading scientists. So if you know, want to know what's on the front line of science is, is scientists are now pretty clear that we're going to go over 1.5 in 2025 in two years time uh, because of the El Nino effect, which you may know about. So it is genuinely, you know, the pump has broken and it is entirely possible and entirely legitimate to be doing all the amazing work that people are doing on the land. And at the same time, uh, when civil resistance is happening, whether that's sitting in Westminster or blocking the M25 or whatever it is, it's all hands on deck to do that, because otherwise we'll have least trust um, ruining everything for us. <laughs> so maybe I'll leave, I'll leave, I'll leave things, uh, leave things at that. Yeah, but yeah, thank you very much, and I, um, yeah, best of luck, everyone. See you Roger. soon. If you could just um, give us the dates and what's happening at the moment, that'd be fantastic. Oh yeah, I thought someone else was doing that. Do apologise. Yeah, so basically, eleven o'clock, eleven o'clock at Downing Street every day for the next two weeks, people will be gathering and occupying Westminster, um, and we're that's the main that's the main sort of action that's being taken. So people sitting down in Westminster and what have you. And we're hoping that will encourage the British judiciary to do their constitutional duty and say that it's treasonous for the British government to dig up more oil. So, yeah, it's all about everyone working together, isn't it? Um, so, yeah, that's the main that's the main thing that's happening with Just Up Oil and uh, Extinction Rebellion is, is, is working with that as well, I think, on the 14th. Thank you, Roger. That's great. Um, yeah. And we will be sharing some links uh, to the website um, where you can follow what's happening because there's all sorts of things happening different days. Direct action is uh, one of the main things, but there's also lots of non-arrestable things that you can join in. Um, so lastly, uh, 
we will be hearing from Rue, who has taken direct action with um, Just Stop Oil. Um, and then we will be going out into breakout rooms uh, where you can learn a little bit more about how you could um, join Just Stop Oil. Um, so do please stay for that. Uh, we're a little bit behind schedule, but we will probably finish about, yeah, just after nine, perhaps. Uh, Rue, are you here? Cool. Hi, everyone. Sorry about the dim lighting. I've got about 30 watts of lights powering my whole home on solar here. Um, so, hi, I'm Rue. I'm in London. I am a origin teacher. Um, so all this land... It's been really interesting to talk, um, but as Roger intimated on a dead planet, it won't come to much, um, and the capitalists are obviously busy destroying everything. Um, so I took action with Just Stop Oil in um, April this year. I went to a fuel depot, and we blocked it for about 12 hours or so. I was sat on top of a oil tanker. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to give you my story of how that came to be. Um, so before I was a foraging teacher, I, I used to be an engineer actually. I was an engineer in um, building services, design. So we used to design low carbon buildings. Um, it used to be called the low carbon economy back then rather than the uh, net zero. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was kind of obvious to anyone who was taking it seriously that um, what we were doing in that industry to decarbonize buildings was in no way um, up to the task of dealing with the situation. And, you know, it was, it was very obvious that um, Radical political action is the only thing that's actually going to make things change. Um, so when Extinction Rebellion came about in 2018, um, having been an environmentalist all my life, it was uh, it was like, well, shit, this is it. Um, and with the climate was starting to to change seriously, um, so I got involved with that. Um, then it's like Britain came along, um, and personally, I did think that it's like Britain was a much kind of better strategy. Um, and and then, yeah, I was like, shit, this really is it. Um, I didn't have the guts to do it's like Britain, I went to all the meetings, um, I was really sorry, I'm going to speak up a bit more, um. So I found it quite intimidating, the idea of doing Insulate Britain, and it was pretty hardcore what they did, <laughs> if, you, if you've seen any of it. Um, so, yeah, I found it really hard to actually um, make myself be part of that campaign, so I didn't, um, but I felt like I should, and then I watched it, um, and I was inspired by what they did and a lot of the mystery about it and the things that I was afraid of um, I could see actually I could see how all of that worked through watching what Insulate Britain did and I thought well yeah actually I could do that um, so then when Just Stop Oil came along I knew that I was going to have to do it. I mean, I've been an environmentalist all my life, um, and I mean, a number of things made me determined to do it. But really, in the end, just the idea of looking back in twenty thirty and thinking, if I hadn't done this, then you know, I wouldn't be able to take myself seriously with all my convictions in life so far um but so i went to meetings and stuff I, to be honest i found it very difficult to connect what was going on in just stop oil which was online 
with my daily life, which perhaps similar to many of you, um, was all practical outdoor stuff, things which always seemed much more important than um, doing something online. Um, so, yeah, I found it hard to actually make myself get involved. And then, but it was coming up, I realized that the last nonviolence training was actually coming up quite soon. And um, so I thought, if I don't go to that, then I'm not going to actually be in the campaign. So I better just do it. Uh, so I forced myself to go to that uh, nonviolent direct action training. And I really recommend to anyone, if you're not sure about civil resistance um, or if you're kind of nearly ready to do it, just go to the training and see how it feels. Um, because when I went to the training, that made the whole thing much more real. And it was really great to go there and meet a whole other bunch of people who are feeling the same as me and were preparing themselves to step into civil resistance. Um, so I did that and I got assigned to my team. Um, and we went to do our action, which is up in Hertfordshire. Um, and so we all went there without our phones. Um, so I, I went up there having kind of like remembers what the map looked like to get to the place. Um, turns out, well, it's a long story, but I went to the wrong town in Hertfordshire um, and then eventually managed to work out what had happened without my phone, which was a weirdly traumatic experience. Uh, and I did make it to the place. Um, and then we did the action. We blocked the uh fuel depot it was very nerve-wracking the night before but to be honest in the event it was actually really fun and uh, exhilarating um everything was done very professionally loads of the other activists were there were really um experienced they knew what they were doing they were very confident with it so we just uh stopped a fuel lorry um climbed on top of it and then we stayed there and it was surreal but it was fine. It was not scary at all being there. Um, and yeah, that formed part of what felt like a fairly successful campaign. The fuel uh, did start to run out in the southeast. If you're around, you may have noticed that. Um, and it was just on the cusp of getting kind of a lot of media traction as well. So yeah. Um, and then since then, I've been to court. On that action, we got charged with um, aggravated trespass for doing that. Um, and yeah, in the end, I pled guilty. That's the easiest thing to do, but you can plead not guilty and then defend yourself in court. Um, so I went to court. I ended up with a £100 fine and a conditional discharge of uh, a year. Um, so got off pretty lightly for it really um so yeah but the main kind of the main part of this whole thing actually is going into the court and you speak to the judge and um, so i gave a lengthy speech they let, they let me get say my whole speech um and you basically explain why you're doing it to the court and a major part of this whole strategy is putting um pressure on the judiciary so that's as, as i see it that's the main part of your job in doing this is you do civil disobedience and then you go to court and you tell it like it had with with moral clarity in the courtroom and um that's a really empowering thing to do it feels really good to have done that and um, it also feels kind of good to stand up to police officers and not be kind of just a obedient um person um so yeah i guess part of this call is just to encourage all of you to um do some civil resistance um because we all know how serious the situation is so um please join us in just a point and i should i don't know how long i've been i guess i should stop now thank you Ru. that's great um yeah it's great to hear the real life stories of people who've got involved in just a foil um yeah you know, people who are taking direct action, they are just normal people who um, feel that it's so important to do something now. Um, 
if you are interested in taking direct action, um, there is a lot of support. Um, there's online trainings. Um, you can go to these trainings and not take direct action. You can just be interested. Um, so yeah, please do um, to get involved if you if you think you might be interested. Um, particularly, you know, people. Need, we need people now in October because this is the where everything is built up to. And yeah, if we can make a real change now, then that will mean a lot. Um, yeah, it can be so frustrating. You know, things are constantly laws are changed. Um, as people have mentioned tonight, the Elms um, has been gone back on recently. And yeah, that's something that people have fought so hard for for years. And now it's just been taken away again. So we do need to say this is what we want. Um, so now we will be going into breakout rooms and it'd be fantastic if you could stay um, because you'll be able to hear a bit more about how these trainings happen and what is going on this month and how you can join in. Um, so the so we have a few questions for you, uh, which we will put in the chat. So the first one is, can you join us in any point this month um, in, uh, in London? Um, and you can check the website for what's happening on what days. Um, but as I said earlier, there is always going to be places for people who don't want to be arrested and just want to come and show support for people. Um, and can you join your local team in some way that could be mobilizing? Um, what I am doing tonight is, uh, you know, we need help with um, spreading the word in many different ways. Um, you could help uh, your regional team to set up meetings in person. Um, donations are also incredibly important at the moment. Um, we can't continue unless uh, we have donations and funding. Um, and there are lots of different payment plans if you're able to donate monthly. 